then we take pride in our democracy, but when we switch on the television, we see the noise coming out of the parliament, and we see that the leader of the house as well as the leader of the opposition, they are not even being allowed to speak. It depresses us. Out of this depression, we want to look some other way. We ch change the channel, we look at the World Cup, Cricket World Cup. Unfortunately, again, the news is depressing. We look around, we see on the national and international front, we have problems in Afghanistan. There is a war looming as far as Iran is concerned. It all depresses us that why this region? We have suffered enough. In all this depressing atmosphere, I'm very happy to say that at least there is one sector in our society from where some good news is coming. And the, that good news is the realization on our part as the relevant organ of the state in charge of dispensation of justice. It is our constitutional responsibility and in Article 37D of the Constitution, it is the responsibility of this organ, the judiciary, to provide inexpensive and expeditious justice. This is a gigantic task, but unfortunately for some time, this has been put on the back burner. Things were just drifting, they were just floating, and nothing was being done to rectify all the wrongs that all of us know about. When I analyzed the whole situation from my own perspective and on the basis of my experience as a lawyer and then as a judge, I realized that out of the two major sections, that is one the civil side, on the other hand is the criminal side, which is the side that I should attend first? And I realized that a person involved in a civil dispute is at least living with his own family, in his own house, in his own environment. He has problems going to the court for a long time, pursuing the matter, but still, he is in the comfort of his own family and friends and atmosphere, surroundings, maybe his own house. But then, on the other side, in criminal cases, people are languishing in jails and for years and years at an end without any prospect of an early conclusion of trial. And nobody even bothers to consider what happens to the wives or the spouses and children of such convicts or such accused persons languishing in jails. Those wives or children, they have not committed any offense. The man might have committed any offense or the prisoner might have committed any offense and the society is very happy to keep him behind bars. But the, wife, the spouse and the children have not committed any offense. But they unfortunately have to suffer more than the prisoner. Generally, crimes are committed by people with lesser means, they are not very well to do people, generally poverty sometimes drives them to commit crimes. And when the bread earner or breadwinner of the family is in jail, that spouse of that breadwinner has no source of income. She is just a housewife, maybe uneducated, illiterate, has no skills except cooking food and washing clothes and cleaning house. Has the society thought about that spouse? Maybe for six months, a year, or two years, the family supports her. What about those young children who have to go to school? They have to be attended to, they have to be coached, they have to be trained by the family as a family unit. But they are without a father. And for some time, yes, the family looks after them for maybe six months, a year, or two years. 
Thereafter, what happens to such people, nobody has even thought about it. Women are driven to uh, odd employments in other people's homes. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes they are physically abused. They are driven to prostitution. They have to survive. Has the society discharged its burden of looking after those affected people? And those children, they have no money to go to school to pay fees. There's no father around to look after their activities. They are ultimately being driven to the same path of committing crimes and falling in bad, bad company. So keeping all this in view, I thought the first thrust of our effort to improve the system should be on the criminal side. That has more urgency in it. So with the help of uh, Mr. Shah and Mr. Soil Nasir, we sat down and we came up with a plan how to deliver justice as quickly as possible. And that too at the trial level. We came up with the idea of model courts with our combined experiences. We came up with a plan and the plan was simple that all possibilities of adjournment have to be eliminated. I was told by my late father, who had practiced law for more than 55 years, that in his days, the trial of a murder case would take three days. And three days were fixed. There was no concept of an adjournment. The police investigating officer was there to produce all the witnesses on behalf of the state. And the judge had no other work except to hold that trial, and the trial was completed in two or three days. That was the norm. So gradually, like all other norms, somehow we deviated from this norm as well. So we thought of different ways how adjournments are uh, uh, necessitated sometimes, why cases are postponed and delayed. And we tried to plug each and every aspect which could uh, uh, cause an adjournment <coughs> in a court. I am not going to go into the details of all those steps because in my first speech, uh, while launching the first phase, I had dealt with those steps, how we have tried to attend. <coughs> and uh, God is very kind, and with the effort and hard work of my uh, judicial officers, the results are absolutely unbelievable. Even I did not expect such a great success of this project. Within 48 working days, we have 5,800 trials decided. It's not appeals. It's not just one argument and a decision, <coughs> like what happens in the High Court or in the Supreme Court. It's a full-fledged trial, and 5,800 trials in 48 days. It's absolutely unbelievable. But this miracle has happened because of the dedication, commitment, not only of the judicial officers, but I must say that with the full cooperation of the legal fraternity as a whole, the, the lawyers, the health authorities, the police authorities, and uh, uh, the jail authorities, everybody has cooperated and things have worked out. So this was the first uh, issue that I thought needs uh, attention and uh, that we have attended to and inshallah, every month on the criminal side, we will try to add one more judge to every district so that within no time, within a few months, the entire districts will be model districts and the, all the judicial courts, the courts will be model courts in the entire country, inshallah, within a few months. The second issue that I thought was critical to any criminal justice system, and that was truthfulness of evidence, truthfulness of testimonies. There cannot be any justice achieved unless there is truthful evidence. And unfortunately, in the year 1951, Lahore High Court noticed in a case, Justice Munir was the author of the judge. He, his lordship, noticed in a judgment that unfortunately, in this part of the world, 
people tell lies, even on oath in a court of law. So he said we have two options. Either we keep on rejecting those testimonies and all the accused will be acquitted, or we somehow allow those witnesses to tell lies and then the judge will be able to sift grain from the chaff and sift truth from that which is untrue. This all started in 1951 till the early 90s when His Lordship Mr. Justice Muhammad Afzal Zullah, the erstwhile Chief Justice of Pakistan, he gave a judgment and said that uh, in an Islamic society, this cannot be allowed. Islamic dispensation of justice is based upon truth. Anything which is false is perjury. And in this Islamic state of Pakistan, if this practice started in 1951 is examined on the scale in the touchstone of Islam, then this cannot be allowed to continue. But his lordship only raised this question, but allowed the activity to continue. Till the year 2019, when Almighty Allah helped me and my colleagues in the Supreme Court to come down very clearly that justice is to be dispensed on the basis of truth and truth alone. And if a witness perjures himself, he gives a false testimony, he is no sifting of grain from the truth. The whole testimony is to be rejected. This, in the legal parlance, as you must be knowing, is called falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus. False in one respect, false in all respects. So we have already declared that in this country where the Constitution itself says that nothing can be enacted against this injunctions of Islam, when the law of the land also makes perjury a, a criminal offense. So how can the judges or the courts allow the witnesses to depose falsely and then take upon themselves to sift grain from the chaff? No. The responsibility lies with the witnesses to tell the truth. And any witness who mixes truth with falsehood, his testimony will be rejected. So these were the two issues, delay and falsehood. So we have attacked both these sides with your support that judiciary will not tolerate this. And we will take every step to eliminate both these causes which are uh, unfortunately um, causing problems in the dispensation of justice in criminal cases. This idea of model courts was started in 2017 in the Lahore High Court. Four districts were introduced. Mr. Justice Mansoor Ali Shah, the Honorable Chief Justice of that time, uh, now His Lordship is our colleague in the Supreme Court. I gave this idea and His Lordship was very kind to accept that. And with the help of Mr. Sohail Nasir again, we launched this and successfully did this in four districts. It was then expanded to seven districts and then God Almighty gave me a chance here in this court, in the Supreme Court, we have launched it throughout the country. And uh, inshallah, as you have been told, that six districts now have zero pendency of murder cases and narcotics cases. Ten districts will, have, will be added next month. Uh, with, uh, so there will be 16 districts without any uh, criminal case pertaining to murder and narcotics pending in the court. So we will expand this to other offenses. But this is the first step. There is a Chinese proverb that the longest journey starts with the first step. The longest journey starts with the first step. So we have taken those first, second, first, second, third, sixth, fifth, sixth steps, and we are already on the journey with your support. And inshallah, we will not stop till we reach the destination, inshallah. <coughs> the so the uh, National Judicial Policy Making Committee, which comprises of the Chief Justice of Pakistan and all the Chief Justices of High Courts in the country, is meeting again on 24th of this month in five days' time. And it is on the agenda that now we are to move to the civil side as well. So civil model, model courts, 
family model courts, rent model courts, and uh, um, magistrates. magistrates model courts. We are launching simultaneously. So we are expanding in all directions of judicial sphere of activity. And uh, civil side, which was being ignored, people used to come and say that civil side should also be attended to. And inshallah, on 24th, we shall decide to expand this project to civil side, family side, rent side, and the magistrate's courts will also be covered by this. So this will, inshallah, be a, another very major step in the right direction. There are two other types of courts which we are going to establish, and they are gender-based violence courts and child courts. You must have heard of juvenile courts, but they are only about criminal activity involving a child. Gender-based violence is common not only in this country, but throughout the world. It's a problem. And generally, it is hushed up. It is not taken to courts. And if taken to courts, uh, normally, uh, the weaker gender does not get a fair treatment because of the atmosphere in the courtroom. I was recently in Russia. Uh, there's a conference, there was a conference at St. Petersburg, a number of chief justices and judges from different parts of the world. And some European court judges were taking pride in the fact that in their country they had one gender-based violence court. Some said we have two. So I kept quiet, kept on listening to them, and then finally I told them that you think that Pakistan may be a very underdeveloped country, but we are going to have 116 gender-based violence courts. In every district of the country, we will have one court where at least the, weak, the weaker segment of the society, the women, they can go to that court and freely say what they want to say, uninfluenced by the atmosphere in the normal courts, where there are male judges, there are male lawyers, there are male prosecutors, there are the, the whole atmosphere is, uh, they, they feel uncomfortable in coming out with their allegations. And then they are cross-examined in a way which embarrasses them. So we are going to, inshallah, have 116 gender-based violence courts, which will be exclude judges will be exclusively trained. The atmosphere of the court will be different from the atmosphere that you see in a in a normal court, so that women uh, and girls they feel comfortable in such an atmosphere. And similarly. We are going to have child courts in every district of the country. It's not a, ju a juvenile involved in a crime, but there are issues about children. Children, how they are treated in the society, there should be some forum or some court where the whole atmosphere of a courtroom is conducive to the well-being of that child involved in the activity. The courtroom we have specially designed, it will not look like a courtroom. It will look like a home where people will be sitting in normal clothes and not in the uniforms and not in the over atmosphere so that the child feels comfortable and he can come up with his problems and a solution is to be found about that. So these are two other courts that we are introducing. Now, another good news. I said there are, in the justice sector at least, there's some good news. Another good news is that we have entered the 21st century through technology. You must have heard about the e-courts. The Supreme Court of Pakistan has the distinction of being the first Supreme Court in the entire world which has uh, started hearing cases through uh, online uh, technology. Recently, for one full week, courtroom number one of the Supreme Court in Islamabad was an e-court, and uh, the lawyers argued their cases at Karachi branch registry, and we heard the arguments at uh, Islamabad, and we decided all the cases. And not even one case was adjourned throughout the week, and all cases were decided. 
the lawyers are very happy because if they have to travel from Karachi to Lahore, they have to uh, forego their uh, uh, attention to the other cases fixed at Karachi. And the litigants are over the moon. They are so happy because for every one peshi, for one date of hearing, the lawyer, uh, the, the litigant has to bring his lawyer from Karachi, which can cost uh, a fortune. Business class ticket, stay at Marriott or Serena, and then uh, a car at disposal of such lawyers, then sumptuous meals at, at night, a good breakfast in the morning, and tomorrow they sit in the court and then the case is adjourned. So once again, the whole expense is to be borne repeatedly by the litigant. So they are over the moon, they're so happy. And the lawyers that appeared, we asked for their feedback, and they also said we're very comfortable and very happy because on a given day, they can argue their case in the Supreme Court as well as appear in the district courts and high court at Karachi. So my first priority for this EEC project was uh, Quetta. I wanted this project to start from Quetta branch registry, but there are some issues of band width and uh, whatever is to be given to such technology, and there are some security issues involved which we are sorting out. And inshallah, in the end of July, we will be starting our e-courts from Quetta as well, inshallah. The second development in technology is that we are going to have a state-of-the-art research center in the Supreme Court of Pakistan. There are five or six world-renowned search engines in internet technology, which search legal uh, cases needed by you. And we have already set up the research center. We have already put in place the infrastructure. One world-famous research engine, LexisNexis, has already been installed. Five or four or five other engines will be installed very soon. And three Supreme Court judges and seven research assistants are going to the United States of America to study this aspect further, visit their research centers, and to get training. So this shows our level of commitment that we want to do something. We want to improve things. And once this is established, it will be made available to the high courts and then made available to the district courts. Any judge sitting in any part of Pakistan will be able to access that research center, give his query that I want research on this issue, give me the case law, the statutes involved, the, give me a comparative, comparative analysis, what happens in Brazil in such cases, what happens in uh, Nicaragua, what happens in England. So with the click of a button, the research as, uh, assistance shall provide even to that civil judge sitting in maybe Chishtia will be uh, able to get the world-renowned research or world-acclaimed research will be available at his doorstep on a click of a button. <laughs> then the last thing that so far we have done, you will be surprised. We are already into artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence uh, is the latest thing in the world. As far as the legal part is concerned, we have already contacted uh, bodies which deal with artificial intelligence, and uh, we have already held meetings. Artificial intelligence for our use will be that entire case law of Pakistan will be fed in the computers first. The facts of every case, all those billions of cases decided so far, they will be fed into computer. And then every judge, maybe sitting in Dharki, will decide a case, but before actually announcing the judgment, he will go to our research center's access to that artificial intelligence, feed the facts of 
the case that is being decided by him, the computer will give him an answer that if these are the facts, then out of these 70 million cases decided in Pakistan's history, if these were the facts, this would be the decision. So the judge, uh, we're not saying that the computer will give a decision. The computer will give a gist on the basis of all decided cases that if these were the facts, this should be the decision. If the judge is already deciding that way, he will feel reassured that yes, I'm on the right lines. But if the judge has decided, is, is minded to decide the other way, then he will be put to caution at least. That maybe in history, if other judges have been deciding this differently, maybe there's something that I'm missing. So he will look at the case again. We are not saying that he will change his decision, but at least he'll be put to caution. And that will be of great help. It will bring consistency, it will bring, bring uh, quality, and uh, uh, there will be chances of going wrong will be reduced. So these are different things that we are doing. And I wanted to share all this with you so that you know that at least in one sector, that is the justice sector, some good news is coming. Out of all this, so remain hopeful of further good news, and inshallah, we'll keep on sharing these news with you. But the best part is that our judges have started delivering. We can have technology, we can have uh, good salaries, we can have good privileges, or you can give anything to a judge. But he will start delivering only if he has that passion. On the first uh, launching of this model project, I had given an example of a chief justice who resigned. And uh, uh, in his resignation letter, he said that 20 years ago, I joined the profession as a judge, and judging was uh, a passion with me. But after all these 20 years, it has become a job, so I'm leaving. So this has to be done with a passion. And uh, the Quranic verse with which Shah Saab started, and we were talking about it before we came here, I want, uh, he started his discourse with that Quranic verse, and I want to end that, uh, uh, my discourse with that Quranic verse. Just imagine what Almighty is saying. Almighty has said, in Allah yuhibbul muqsiteen, ke Allah ta'ala insaf karne walo se mahabbat karta. God is not saying, I like these people. Examine the words used by God Almighty. In Allah yuhibbul muqsiteen, mahabbat karta. Agar khaleke kainat, this is sab cheez ka malik hai, agar wo aap se mahabbat karna shuru kar hai, तो आप सोचें आपको कभी कोई तकलीफ आने देगा किसी भी फील्ड में सेहत में अकल में माल दौलत में इज्जत में जब आपका इतना बड़ा आपसे मोहब्बत करने वाला एक मौजूद हो लोग हम पढ़ लेते हैं कुरान मजीद कभी गौर नहीं करते तो इस पर जब मैं गौर करता हूं इन द होली कुरान देयर आर सेवन different kinds of people that God Almighty says that I love them. What are categories of six categories? You should read them. So, from that one, that Allah loves the people of God. So, this love you will be able to create when you start with your passion. You will be able to create your own life, your own life, your own life, your own family, your own home, your own home. اور پھر جب اللہ محبت کرنا شروع کر دے اور اتنا بڑا پروٹیکٹر آپ کو مل جائے تو کسی چیز سے گھبرانے کی ضرورت نہیں رہتی اور اسی لئے اللہ تعالیٰ نے بارہا قرآن مجید میں فرمایا ہے کہ ایسے جو لوگ ہوں گے وَلَا خَوْفُنَ لَيْهُمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ نہ ان کو خوف ہوگا نہ ان کو کوئی غم ہوگا تو اور کیا چاہیے It's so easy and welcome aboard Thank you very much
چیف جسٹس آصف سعید کھوسا تقریب سے خطاب کر رہے تھے جس میں انہوں نے کہا کہ مقدمات جلد نہ نمٹانے کی وجہ سے لوگ جیلوں میں ہیں جرائم کے خاتمے کے لیے نظام کو بہتر کر رہے ہیں ساتھ ہی ساتھ انہوں نے معیشت کے بارے میں بھی بات کی اور کہا کہ یہ کہا جا رہا ہے کہ معیشت آئی سی او میں ہے معیشت کی خبریں سن کر مایوسی ہوتی ہے ساتھ ہی ساتھ یہ کہا کہ مارڈل کورٹس فوری انصاف فراہم کر رہی ہیں فوری انصاف کی فراہمی اولین ترجیح ہے چیف جسٹس آصف سعید کھوسا ایک تقریب سے خطاب کر رہے تھے اور انہوں نے کہا کہ ہمیں افغانستان سمیت دنیا بھر سے بری خبریں سننے کو ملتی ہیں